to God be the glory for all of the things that he has done. I mean big things, little things, impossible things, and great things. Just the other day, and we realized that there is another hurricane or two maybe out there, but the other day we can certainly thank God that he spared us. We're no better than the people in Houston, no better than the people in Florida, but it is of the Lord's mercies that we've not been consumed. For his compassion fail not, they are new every morning, and great has been his faithfulness. And he's been faithful to us. And so I want to thank him. I really do for all that he has done and for what he's still yet getting ready to do. God put this little song in my heart very early this morning. And before I get into my message, I'd just like to sing a little bit. I don't know about tomorrow, and I just live from day to day, and I don't From life's sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray, and I don't worry about the future. For I know what my Jesus said, and today he walks beside me, for he knows what lies overhead. Many, many times, oh, about tomorrow, I just can't seem to understand, but I Your hand 
your hand, your hand. I just want you to know, Missy and Rachel and to the family, God sees, he hears, and he knows. And he said, I'd never leave you and never forsake you. And he's holding your hand. Don't you worry about nothing. Rest in Jesus. Because Scott is resting. He's home now. And he's home. I'm so grateful to God that the small portion that he was in my life, uh, his smile, the innocence, the love of God all the time that he spoke. Scott didn't have sense enough to complain about nothing. And he didn't. And I take that from him today. I really do. If Scott didn't complain, when I, the last time I saw him and went to the hospital, had had um, the medication that they had given him. But you know what? Mama was sitting there, and even he lay there when I walked in, and he said, I love you. He knew me, and he said to me, I love you. And I said, Scott, I love you too. And that's what he was, a bundle of joy and a bundle of love. Rick said it best yesterday when he said, Scott, so let his light shine, and he did. And I'm just so grateful for what God has done and for what God is still yet getting ready to do. Amen. Almighty God and gracious Father, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the Father of glory. God, there is no preacher but you, Lord. There is no glory but yours, Lord. No word but the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. God, I ask you right now to speak through me and speak for me. Heavenly Father, thank you, Heavenly Father, for thinking through, speak through my mouth and think through my mind that those that are listening may not resist the wound of your Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen again. For those of you who may have your personal Bibles, and if you don't, I'm going to be, if you turn with me from the book of Mark, the fifth chapter, the 25th through the 34th verse, Mark, the 5th chapter, 25th through the 34th verses. I'm going to be reading to you out of the Amplified Bible. And it reads as thus, And there was a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years, and who had endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but instead grew worse. She had heard the reports concerning Jesus, and she came up behind him in the throng and touched his garment. For she kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. I shall be made whole. And immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source. And suddenly she felt in her body that she was healed of her distressing ailment. And Jesus, re recognizing in himself that the power proceeded from him, had gone forth, turned around immediately in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples kept saying to him, you see the crowd pressing hard around you from all sides and you ask who touched your clothes? Still he kept looking around to see her who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had been done for her, though alarmed and frightened and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith, your trust and confidence in me, springing from faith in God, has restored you to health. Go in into peace, continually healed and freed, from your distressing bodily disease. I want to use for a subject briefly, your faith, 
has made you whole. It is my firm belief that without the experiences or the difficulties and challenges and sufferings in our lives, that we would never know fully or never understand or appreciate the rewards of Jesus. We will never know what God can do or what God will do. Ever since sin entered in this mean old world, humanity has been facing great problems. And there is not a person in this place this morning that does not have some kind of issue. There's not a person in this place that does not have some kind of problem. And God never told us that we would be problem free. But he said in John the 16th chapter and the 33rd verse, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good courage. Take courage, be confident, uh, uh, certain and undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you, and I have conquered it for you. And the reason God could tell us that is because God's adversity, because adversity is God's university for us. Let's face it, you and I will never have a problem-free life, not now, not tomorrow, and not ever. None of us. Problems happen. They happen to rich people. Problems happen to poor people. Problems happen to educated people, black people, white people, Christians, and non-Christians. But not all People see problems the same way. Some people are overcome by problems. Some people are left bitter. Others are left better. Some people face the challenges with fear. And others face the challenge with faith in God. And I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How are you handling your problems? Some of our problems or issues are self-imposed, while others have been spiritual attacks from the depths of hell. But no matter what the source, God has used our suffering, our issues, our trials, and our adversity to build our spiritual character, our endurance, our capacity for love and mercy and anger and envy and pride. And you know all of those things that might lie dormant until they are awakened by circumstances in our lives. Because I say this all the time, untested faith is not faith at all. But our faith or our strength of character is not shown when all is going well in our lives. But it is in the pressure of human pain and suffering is when our faith is really shown. And it's in the pressure of human pain and suffering when you find out who and what you actually believe in. So that is why this morning I want to talk about a certain woman. I want to talk about this certain woman with the issue of blood. And when we call that name automatically, we know something about her story. I know you know about her story. Her story may be found in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in them we find that she does not have a name because she has been identified by her issue. She has been identified by her problem, the woman with the issue of blood. And sometimes our problems become so big in our life that it consumes all of our identity. And I know that to be true because I identify with her. Have you ever had an issue or a crisis, a sickness, 
or something in your life that so consumed you or overwhelmed you that you lost sight of who you were. That you actually forgot that you were a child of God. That you actually forgot who your father was. And all you could talk about to friends and to people. And even when you prayed, all you could talk about to God was how big your problem was. Or how big your problem. And you know, people get tired of hearing it. And you wonder sometimes why people don't want to talk to you. On the phone, ignore you. Because that's all you talk about. Woe is me. I want you to know that when you start talking more about the problem rather than the promises of God, Whatever you praise becomes magnified in your life. Zip it. And sometimes we forget. We're so overwhelmed. And all we can see is how big our problem is. And we forget that the unchanging nature of Jesus. We forget that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, according to Hebrews 13 and 8. In other words, God does not change over the ages. The body of Christ has been sitting around long enough and keeping quiet long enough. You got to get tired. It's time for all of us in here this morning to get up, to speak up, take a stand and take charge. Satan has not taken a holiday, and he's not going to take a holiday. Satan is on the loose trying to keep the church from speaking up because he knows that he cannot stand against the word of God. But if you don't have no word on the inside... You can't talk back till he beats up on you. I came to tell you today that we need to follow the lead of the woman with the issue of blood. We cannot live on just coming to church, to the house of prayer every Sunday, going home and leaving, living defeated lives. Always looking for somebody to pray for you. We cannot live on just getting prayed for. It's more than that. We have got to lose ourselves in the word of God and open your mouth and tell Satan who you are and whose you are. There is a word in Hebrew, the Hebrew language. And that word is spelled D-A-B-A-R, and it is pronounced Dabar. And in the Greek language, that word, same word, is Rima. And it means to speak. You see, God created man a unique being, a speaking spirit created in the image of God, different than all of the animals. God gave and the unique gift of intelligent speak, speech. And that intelligent speech contains the power both to create and to arrange things. Did you know that? Think about it. When we speak, we can set the tone in a place. When we speak, we can arrange the atmosphere. 
especially given how we say something or what we say to people. Think about it. We can change the atmosphere around us at our homes, on the job, and everywhere. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, all that you have today and all that you are today is the result of what you have believed in yesterday and what you have said yesterday. It's a proven fact. Neurologists have proven that the speech center in the brain drives and controls all the systems in your and my body. In other words, our body system respond to what we say. Are the words you speak, are they life? Are the words you speak, are they death? The words you speak, do they give you hope? Are the words you speak, do they give you or do they encourage you or disencourage you? Do you know that you can talk to somebody for about three or four minutes, conversation, and you can know everything about them in, in that, that length of time. I promise you, you can. Because the words you speak locate you. The words you speak fix the landmarks of your life. Just listen to somebody's conversation, just for a little while. You'll know what, basically, what you need to know if you really want to be around them and if you don't. Just from their conversation, that's just it's a fact. In the beginning, I'm reminded that the Word was with God. The Word was God and the Word was with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Mark, the fifth chapter and the 27th verse says that, the woman heard the reports concerning Jesus. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And she kept saying, if I only can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I shall be restored to health. In other words, from the beginning, when she heard about the reports of Jesus, she began to speak faith. It began from her mouth. Romans 4 and 17 said, Call those things that be not as though they were. And that's why God's word tells us in Proverbs 18 and 21 that death and life are in the power of your tongue. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now look at the, some of the history about the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says the woman's condition had existed for 12 long years. Can you imagine 4,380 days waking up knowing that you had a problem that was not getting any better and it was the same problem? year after year after year after year for 12 years. And it had grown worse. Not only was she defined by her issue, she was disqualified because of her state of condition. So socially, she couldn't go to church. Disqualified from worshiping the Lord because the Levitical law considered her defiled and unclean. So now, she can't go to church. She got an issue that has lasted 12 years. She was broke, out of money, has spent all that she had and still no cure. Now, ashamed on top of everything else, embarrassed, ostracized from family and friends and the community. And you know what? She was really a case study now in low self-esteem. A pity party. But 
there's something different about her. Desperation had begun to drive her. She had hit what we call rock bottom. Have you ever hit rock bottom in your life? She had hit rock bottom. I wonder if anybody in here that got a problem bigger than they can fix, bigger than you can solve. You can't call nobody. You sure can't write a check. You can't fix it. You don't have no money to solve it. And you don't know what to do. Have you ever been there? I have. But God. Well, when you hit rock bottom, let me tell you a story. And you know Jesus. You are just in the right position for the great manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I promise you. I know it. You see, great faith is born when you have run out of all your human options. Can't call nobody. I ain't got no family here. I ain't got no sugar daddy, no husband, no nobody. Hello. I've been there. That's right. Great faith, great faith bursts forth when man's limitations fail. Great faith erupts when you hit rock bottom and there is nobody to turn to but Jesus. <laughs> now desperate, she had heard about Jesus and the Bible said in Romans 10 and 17, like I said, faith come by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now this certain woman could have allowed her issue to stand between her and the only means of restoration. She could have. But what this sister did is what I'm hoping some of us will do today. I'm talking about position yourself for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You got to get into position. What do you have to lose? You ain't got nothing. You done run out of options. You done tried everything that's your way, and it ain't worked. You done spent all of your money going from doctor to doctor, specialist to specialist, and he ain't done you no good. So why don't you try Jesus? Hebrews 11 and 6 said, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who cometh to God must what? Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently do something you ain't been doing. Diligently. Cut the TV off diligently. Turn the plate down diligently. Set up a prior time, a meeting time. Not to go out to lunch, but with Jesus. You got to get radical. You want something from Jesus. You got to do some things you ain't been doing. So that is just what she did. She got aggressive. She got determined. I can see her in my mind getting ready to make her way to see the specialist of all specialists, Dr. Jesus. Look at great fate, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life in the power of the tongue. She had already set a point of releasing her faith by speaking it. You see, our faith has got to be more than easy believism. The book of James said, you believe that God is one, you do well. So do the demons believe and shudder in terror and horror, such as make a man's hair stand on end and contract the surface of his skin? 
According to James 2 and 19. But the demons won't bow. They know. But they know better than you. Let me tell you one thing. I say this and it's funny, but it's true. Satan been to heaven and you ain't. That's why he don't want you to go. That's why he do everything to destroy you, to keep you frustrated, tripped up, confused. He ain't got no new games, same old games. But look what the word of God said. So also faith, James the second chapter in the 17th verse, if it does not have works, deeds, actions of obedience to back it up by itself, it is destitute of power, inoperative, dead. Dead. It has got to be more than you said, oh, I believe in God. Just told you the demons do too. They shout at the name of Jesus, but they ain't going to bow down. It's got to be that, oh, I believe in God. So what you going to do about it? What you going to do? You got to put feet to prayer. You got to get up, stand up. You got to take charge. Learn how to pray for your own self. Give God the praise. Praise your way through. He said, who so offered praise glorify me. To him that ordered his conversation all right, will I show the salvation of God? Open up your mouth. Get up early. Fix some time with Jesus. Don't drop down on your knees at night and go to sleep. And then said, oh, Lord, I'm just so tired. <laughs> you wake up five minutes later and said, oh, good night, Lord. No, 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 honey, you got to do more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but she backed it up. She said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I know I shall be made whole. She had never seen him. She only heard about him. The Bible said she did it. So guess what? I could see her making her way down, getting her parasol, getting her jacket. You know what she did? She broke all the rules of the law. She broke man-made protocol. She made her way down through the crowd. Wasn't supposed to be there. Because the Levitical law say you're unclean and defiled. But she went on, made her way down through the crowd, came up behind Jesus. And the Bible said, touched his garment. Say immediately. Say immediately. Immediately. Because the Bible said immediately. Talking about right now. I'm talking about suddenly. I'm talking about one touch from the master's hand after 12 long years made her whole. One touch immediately, right now, made her whole. Jesus said, who touched me? And it sounds crazy to the disciples, and it sounds crazy to me and you because he's an all-knowing, seeing God. And we know he knew. Who had touched him. Out of all of the people out there that day. He said who touched me. Well what was the difference. In all of the people who had brushed up against him all day. It was a lot of people in the crowd. Couldn't hardly move. You know how you bump up against somebody. It was something different. What was the difference of people who had been brushing up against him all day. Nobody had ever drawn down the glory that he had to release. Not the Pharisees, 
with their big velvet robes who were the theologians of the law? Not them. Not the disciples who argued who would be on the left and who would be on the right side, you know, sorry. Not none of them. Not the big time preachers who came, who had the mega churches. Not the great musicians who came and said, my choir is better than your choir. We coming on down to the meeting. But you know, we won the McDonald three times in a row. I got to make this funny, because this is how we think. Not any of those, but a poor, nameless, no-name, handmade servant who was hungry for the things of God. That day, the Bible said, she was transformed from a nobody with no name to a daughter. What will you do to touch Jesus? Look at your own issue. Look at your own problem. Look at your own household. Look at your own children. Look at your own finances. Because we all got some kind of, look at your own health. What will you do to touch Jesus? We're always waiting for a handout from everybody. We want everybody to do everything. They just pray for me. Oh, oh Lord, what about me? Well, where, where, when you going to play your part? Because you got a part to play. We want everybody to pray us up. Do everything, and then you get mad sometimes. Leave the church. What was it? I don't know. It wasn't good today. I didn't enjoy myself at all. I'm just not going back next Sunday. Don't come back then. Because you ought to come in here already prayed up. We shouldn't have to lift you up. You ought to be lifted when you come in. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't have to get up this morning. The storm could have hit us. We could have not had homes or water or nothing. But God, in his mercy and greatness, passed us by one more time. I didn't even have to be walking this morning. Some mornings I get up and I waddle because my legs hurt. But thank God for Jesus. I'm running this morning without a pill. Without anything, thank you, Jesus. It's the Spirit of the Lord on the inside. I'm grateful. You know the Lord gets tired of us complaining. What more can he do? What more can he do? He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What more can it do for you? When you going to do your part? When you going to do your part? And then if you come in and somebody just not meaning to, didn't speak, or did, I don't know, she didn't speak to me today. Well, you speak. What's wrong with your mouth? You go and said, oh, girl, I, you, you, girl I, you, I didn't get to holler at you today. You speak. Why you, everybody got to wait on you? I get tired. I do. You know why? Because I'm not a complainer. I told you I zip it. Silence is powerful. What's wrong, mama? You ain't saying nothing. Got nothing to say. Because when I said they don't want to hear, because I'm going to eat them. <laughs> I'm telling you. This young lady's story this morning stands out because her faith did it. Her faith did it. 
God said, daughter, thy faith has made you whole. She played her part. There was no magic, I want you to know, in the hem of the garment. There wasn't no healing down now. It was her faith. Yes, God loves us. Yes, he cares about our tears. But what moves God is your faith. That's what moves God. Now faith. It don't say tomorrow's faith. The word says in Hebrews 11, 6, now, N-O-W. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith. That means do it now. Now. I'm reminded of pastor, and he drives this, and he has driven this into me, and I'm not kidding. He didn't know how important this has been to me because I was a person that wasn't doing this. Pastor said, believe and receive. A lot of times I was believing, but I wasn't receiving because, you, you, you know what? I didn't feel worthy. But pastor has driven that. At believe, 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 and receive. And that's what she did. She believed after hearing what Jesus had done and what he could do, and she just did it. She just received it by faith. Isn't, doesn't that sound simple? Why can't we do it? Why don't we do it? We got to analyze everything. <laughs> How would you like to have those words on your spiritual resume? What type of spirit catches the eye of God? I want to leave you with that. What type of spirit catches the eye of God? What qualifies as a different spirit than all of those people in the crowd? A no-name woman, not the Pharisees, or big-time preachers. That woman. I want you to know that problems are battery acid. You know what? If you marinate your mind in your problems, they will eventually corrode and corrupt your thoughts. They will. But thoughts of God's power and what he is able to do what he has already done for you and what he can do according to what the word of God says in Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I may ask or think according to the power that worketh in me. The power of the Holy Spirit that work on the inside which can do far more than I ever dared or thought will preserve and refresh your attitude. If you just say to God, God, I don't know if you've done it for anybody else, but I thank you for doing it for me. I'm standing on your word. I'm standing on your promise. I don't know how you're going to fix it, but I know you're going to fix it. I ain't got no time limit against you because what do I know about time? Whenever you do it, God, I know it'll be in the nick of time, right in the nick. And you know what the nick of time is? Right on time. God has been to me in the neck at the 11th hour, coming up on the 12th hour. Woo, Jesus, it's the 12th hour, Lord. And he come right on through. Yes, he does. I'm not kidding. My whole life has been that way, my adult life, since I've been to divorce. Trust what I tell you. God has taken care of me. I look around and 
saw it sometime at the beginning of the month, said, I'm going to do all of this with this. When I look around, I'm on the third of the night. I said, look at Jesus. The bills done been paid. The children are eating. We done ate too much. I'm serious. I tell you this. I use me because I don't care who knows. I've been driving my son's little truck for about three or four years. Maybe might be longer than that. Because mama couldn't afford no car, no. And guess what? He changed jobs, and the child needed his truck. He said, Mama, I got to have my truck now, because I done changed jobs, and I, I ain't got the company truck. And I said, what? Him and Mama both got doctor's appointment. I have to pick up Joshua. I got to do that. I said, Lord, what I'm going to do? I ain't got no money for no down payment. What I'm going to do? So he said, I don't know, Mama. You got to do something now. I got to have my truck. Three days, Mama over there. Me and Mama stayed on our face three days. And I ain't telling you that my credit been the greatest. When you go through a divorce, it runs you in mid ways you don't know, and it takes a long time to come up. And I've been working on it and working on it, looking like it ain't coming up where it need to be. So, third day, am I lying, Mama? Third day, Spirit of the Lord said, go on, get up and call the bank. I didn't want to. Get up and call the bank. I got on up, telling you this, and I'm getting ready to leave. But I want you to know practical things. Got up and called the bank. Went on and put the application in. They said, call back in an hour. Oh, old Rose didn't call back in an hour. Scared. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to call back in an hour. So Mama said, then they said, call back in an hour. I said, be quiet, Kate. <laughs> Mama said, we need a car. I said, I know it. <laughs> I'll call the next day, mama. Let me pray on it. Next day, I call. This is honest truth. This is the way God has worked my life. I called back the next day, and I told him my name and everything. She said, okay, Miss Williams, just hold on. I said, why is she taking so long? <laughs> Came back. She said, you've been approved for the car. <laughs> Look at Jesus. Hallelujah. I said, what do I do now? Because I need a car today. She said, well, I don't know you ain't going to get that car today. I said, well, honey, I got to have the car today. I said, because tomorrow my baby got to go to school, and we got doctor's appointment. She said, well, now you get try. I said, oh, no, I ain't going to try. I'm getting the car today. I went on and spoke. I said, I'm getting the car today. So she said, well, go on and look for a car. I said, okay, I'm going to find a car. Let me tell you what. No, this is the truth. I lied to you not. I was on the phone. That was 12 o'clock then. Bank closed at 5. I was on the phone from 12 o'clock till about 2 o'clock. The bank, my bank, CPM, Federal Credit Union, have a car service where you get cars through them. I found the car that I wanted. This one over here. We got to get red for the blood of Jesus. I said, whatever, mama. We just got to get a working car. I want red. I said, Mama, hush. <laughs> this one over here. I called about the car, and I said to uh, the guy, I said, see this car, blah, blah, this, gave him the particulars. He said, I'm in Georgia. I have three car lots, one in Somerville, one in Mount Pleasant, one this and that. He said, you like the car? I said, I do. He said, well, I said, but I don't have no way to get there. And I need the car today. I need to try some cars out. I said, but I, there's one particular one. He said, well, let me tell you one thing. I don't know, Rose. There's something about your voice. I said, what? He said, I don't know. He said, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to call my secretary from Georgia, where you live. And I told him, he said, I'm going to send her to pick you up.
I said, you going to send her to Mark's corner to get me? He said, yeah. He said, and then, Rose, I want to tell you another piece of information. This was Jesus. He said, do you have any money to put down? I said, not a dime. Hallelujah. Not one dime. He said, okay. So you'll just be there. I said, whatever the bank says, that's it, Bubba. I need to call. No, I did. This is true. He said, well, you know what, Rose? He said, that is, even though I own these car lots, he said, but that's part of my ministry. He said, Rose, let me tell you what, I'm not a greedy man. He said, and I really don't need your money. He said, I believe in helping people, all color, all kinds of people. He said, and the spirit of the Lord told me, it's something about you. I got to help you. I said, I'm glad you know Jesus because he know I need to call. This is the truth. They came. The lady came, found my house, picked me and Mama and Joshua up, took me to the place. We drove. There we get there. Do you know now the red car? I said, that was the red car. She came. Here she, she, Mama can't see but a titty bit. She said, what, is that the red one? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, this is it. We drove it. I said, Mama, let's look. I don't want no other car. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I said, you ain't even driving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mom. That was the best one for us. And let me tell you one thing. It was then about 3.30, 4 o'clock. They called my bank. And uh, the lady said, Miss Rose, they don't do you're not going to be able to get that car today because I don't have anything to do with who pro who's the processor at the bank. And she said, it's already almost 4 o'clock, and you will have to go all the way to Somerville uh, to your bank. I said, that's where. I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. They know me at the bank. Can you call? She said, I will, but I don't think. She called the bank, and they, the lady said, I said, tell them Rose Williams is on the phone. Lady came there. She said, that Rose? I said, yes. She said, tell Rose she wants the car today. I'll get the papers done, and I'll wait at the bank on her. The favor of God. You hear me? There's benefits. The favor of God. I said, well, how am I going to get there? Lady gave me, she dangled the key. She says, your car, go and take it. Go on to the bank. I went to the bank, got the papers, came back. I was at the bank so fast. She said, now, Miss Rose, you didn't get a ticket. I said, no, honey, I didn't get no ticket. <laughs> the lady was waiting on me at the bank. That's the truth. And let me tell you one thing. I got the, the went in, signed. She had the papers ready for me. She said, Rose, I said, well, I got to get, she said, uh, uh, let me tell you one thing. I said, here's, here's my insurance. I'm going to put it on there as soon as I get back, you know. Did that. Went back to the car dealer, gave them their papers. Had the certified check already ready. She said, I don't know who you are. She said, but this don't get done like this, this fast. I say, honey, if you only knew. I'm a child of the Most High King. My daddy is rich with houses and lands. He said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. I said, honey, if you only knew. I said, my daddy knew I had, he had that car waiting on me. And he did. I want to thank God. Yes, sir. I know, he works just that suddenly and immediately just that fast he did and i'm so grateful to him and let me tell you then they gave me a payment that i could afford she said miss rose what you want the payment be i said real cheap real cheap girl because you gotta work up in here <laughs> she did 
And let me tell you this. I got one more tidbit to tell you. Am I lying, Mom? He wanted more for the car. Okay? He wanted um, 500 more. Or th was it 1,000 more? He wanted 1,000 more. He called. I said, oh, wait a minute. This is, I, I thought the price was, he, so she said to me, I said, well, I ain't going to be able to get it after I got there. I said, the check is for this and that. She said, let me call him on the phone. He's in Georgia now. Called him on the phone. He said, Miss Rose. I said, yeah, I can't get the car now because the bank, the check is for something. And you want, you want $1,000 more. And so I said, I don't have $1,000. And I said, so thank you very much. He said, no, 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 no. He said, let me tell you one thing. Did not tell you that you was leaving with the car? I said, so, huh? He said, did not tell you that I'm not greedy? That it's something about you that the Spirit of the Lord told me? He said, what did the check say? He said, put her on the phone, the secretary. He said, give her the car for what that check said. <laughs> then a couple of days later, he called me back. He said, guess what I got for you? I said, what? He said, $50 give out. I said, I'll be in pick it up. <laughs> Didn't want to go back. But I'm just telling you the goodness of the Lord. Yes, he did. Yes, he, that's how good God is. That's how suddenly, that's how immediately, that's how right now that he can work. If he did it for the woman with the issue of blood who didn't have a name, what about you? <laughs> Whose name is on the palm of his hand. What about you? I just want to tell you thank you for listening. Sometimes I like to be funny, but it's true. God is good. So I want to leave you with one of my favorite scriptures found in Psalms 24 and 7. So lift up your heads, O ye gates. Don't know what you might be going through. But be ye lifted up everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? Come on. The Lord and hosts. The Lord and mighty. He is the King of glory. Be blessed.